welcome everyone to Ochato, the fortnightly podcast where we drink tea and review manga. I am Sue Ellen. I'm Oliver. And I am Jade. Every two weeks we will pick a manga that one of us has recommended and we will read up to a certain chapter and discuss the manga with a mega ton of spoilers. This week we are reading The Promised Neverland. The story by Kaoru Shidari and art by Posuka Demizu. We are reading up to chapter 37. Uh, it's recommended by me. I love the series. Before diving in, we must know the answer to the most important question. What is everyone drinking in the mug? Today, it's Paka Triple Mint because I have just had dinner and I was too full for property. I'm also hopping on the Paka train and I have the Feel New tea. You know what? I feel like we all own Puka, like free mint tea. We should all just one day the star will align and we will all have the exact same. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's going to happen. So, Sue Ellen, what are you drinking in your cup? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, we could just skip that. Well, well, well you can't avoid this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you see, I, I'm very tired and I don't own any caffeinated tea, so I purposefully just drink good old. Uh, dihydroxide uh wait hyd- hydroxide oxide <laughs> hydroxide <laughs> uh, dihydroxide <laughs> you're saying water it's what i'm hearing mm. <laughs> hmm. you know, it does at least qualify as a drink so it, uh, we'll, pa- we'll pass it <laughs> we still haven't think of a punishment it's been we did this from like episode one one day we'll think of something good maybe yeah. they have to watch no, that's not a punishment. That's a reward. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we need more thinking. I was going to say watch the anime, but that's great. But then again, water is punishing uh, by itself. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, tasteless. <laughs> what? It's great. Okay, all right. I Enough mean... about tea. Let's talk about manga. <laughs> yes. So we are reading The Promised Neverland. It was first serialized in Shonen Jump from 2016. And it's finished this year, June 15th. 2020. Wow. Did not realize it had finished, actually. Yeah, it's completely finished. And it's about three children, Emma, Norman, and Ray. They're the brightest kids at the Gracefield House orphanage. And under the care of the woman they refer to as mom, all the kids have enjoyed a comfortable life, good food, clean clothes, and the perfect environment to learn. What more could an orphan ask for? One day, though, Emma and Norman uncover the dark truth of the outside world they are forbidden from seeing. And now we all know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> that we do. Um, it's worth mentioning here that it was serialized in Shonen Jump and you can read it on Viz, if you're, at least if you're in the UK. Um, they've got a very cheap subscription. It's like, what, two quid a month? One quid a month? One ninety nine a month. And you get access to just about everything there, including all of the Bombus Neverland. And... Mm-hmm. 900 catches of them. Yep, there's a, there's a lot of manga there. Would recommend. Yeah, so let's start with first impressions. Firstly, how did everyone handle the uh, twist? Did you see it coming or was it like it smacked at you like a, like, a, like a wrecking ball? So from the title, The Promised Neverland, I thought that the story was going to be something akin to that shown in Your Name or A Silent Voice, just, you know, high school children living their kind of school romance lives. No, that was not the case in The Promised Neverland. (laughs) The first chapter shocked me so much and it just crept up on me. And that transition from you know, the cuddly life to hardcore exam mode life to scary stuff was just so quick. It actually sort of gave me Danganronpa vibes, kind of the hunting aspect of it and sort of the constant mind games reminded me of Kaguya-sama when they were trying to figure out what the other side was doing and thinking. So I really, really enjoyed it. That was my first impression. And the twists were incredible. Never have I seen a manga do twists so quickly, but with so much swiftness as well. Uh, Mine was a bit different because I had seen episode one of the anime. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about that and then talk about what it was like coming into the manga. So I'd only seen the first episode of the anime. But um, as they kind of do in the manga, you can kind of tell some things a bit off pretty early on. 
the anime actually starts off with them kind of looking out from a very tall gate. Um, and that was like, I knew nothing about the, about the show like coming in. And I was like, hmm, okay, all right, sum things up because you don't have that kind of symbolism without something being wrong. And then over the course of the first episode, they have just enough like shots that are slightly off from what you'd be expecting something nice to be. But I was like, nah, okay, something's up. So that pretty early twist they have, the bit where they find the monsters and the truck, I kind of saw it coming, but it was still, it was still quite a good one. It actually, for me, had more of an effect in the manga because you have this bit where Emma's hiding under the truck and you know, you know something's up. And then in the anime, you get more of a hint of what's going on. But in the manga, you just turn a page and boom, it's there. Uh, and that was pretty scary, actually. Um, so yeah, very good first impression. I liked the kind of vibe they had going on. For me, it was a lot like Attack on Titan, where you have this kind of enclosed space where life is simple, but something else is up. Yeah, they both have the wall. <laughs> the wall, yeah. Oh, yeah, same with me. I mean, I come into it half blind as in i knew it was dark right because that's why i was intrigued by it people were saying oh you know, yeah it's really dark you know it's it's really good as well um so i was sort of expecting something not right but never in my life i would have expected that you know these kids are at farm basically like farm animals and waiting to be slaughtered there's just so many layers to, to this where I'll, we'll talk about it more in depth uh, into the episode uh but definitely when I first read it um with the idea of you know something dark has happened like I didn't notice like why are they all wearing white <laughs> like hmm like and yeah. why do they do these creepy exams where they look so intense in their face like like chill I know it's an exam but like calm <laughs> the numbers too as well were just very oh, like hmm. it's like hmm yeah but yeah the twist came really well um even though well for me i expected the twist but didn't expect that twist uh and it was just yeah it was amazing going further in the story um one thing i sort of really appreciate about the manga is that it has so many layers of twists it's like when you think you're like ah cool okay this is linear i see where this is going and then bam <laughs> It's actually someone else's plan, like someone else planned something else that like can capture it. And then I think I made a list like close to like every time they like review something or like that as a reader, if you weren't like paying attention, if you just so caught up in the story, you wouldn't like realize there's like a good nine or 10 things on there. It's just incredible. It's so rewarding when you find these things and everything connects to you together yeah i was the same with all the hidden layers and all the twists and turns for example i think the first one that really shocked me was when isabella revealed her id number and i was like whoa like this is going somewhere else and i also like that we have the viewpoints from both the kids and isabella and i also like that every step of every person's plan is outlined really really well and it actually makes logical sense um, yeah, I mean, the, the planning I liked, it was good with the reveals. You kind of have to have that suspension of disbelief that they're all like 12, well, 11 and under, because it's, it's, they're a lot smarter than me. <laughs> Even the five-year-olds, I'm like, damn. <laughs> um, oh, the, I mean, they show some of the, so they show some of the questions that they're answering in the manga. And it's like, it's doable. And I would expect it to be like, maybe one of the slightly harder questions at GCSE level. But that's like, you know, 16 year olds. Um, and to have 11 year olds do that and they, they have, what was it, 10 seconds per question? Whereas I'd, I'd give like a GCSE student from, this is from my tutoring days, I'd give them like maybe five, six minutes for that kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that kind of sets the bar on how, how smart everybody is. And then when you have these kind of ridiculous like plot twists, as long as you're willing to accept that, it's quite easy to also accept the plot twists because they do make sense. And it's not some ridiculous deus ex machina kind of stuff. Um, it's just like, wow, they actually were like four steps ahead. But so was the so were the villains, you know, um, it's good. It's good. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I was actually thinking. Um, so as you know, you see that people, uh, Norman, Ray, Isabella and Sister Crow, they're all sort of playing 4D chess with each other. <laughs> it's insane. And you just every 
yeah, every time it's like you think, oh, they're ahead of the game. But no, someone else was ahead all along. But then you think you believe that and then there's someone else. Like, I just, these sort of twists re- uh, are being revealed to you. Were you at any point, you're like, ah, that was a bit convenient. Or you're like, mm, like questioning the logic. I guess it makes sense overall, but it's like, sometimes you feel like these characters like caught on too fast. So was there any point where you sort of doubt that they sort of, you know, too intelligent? Almost? Nah, I was well along for the ride. I was enjoying it. Um, mm. I'm perfectly fine with, like it's an anime, right? Somebody's going to be really good at something. And since they seem actually pretty normal physically, uh, as in like they're not doing any ridiculous jumps or stuff, um, I'm perfectly fine accepting that they're going to have these nutty mind games. Yeah, uh, not sure really. I think I was just too swept into the world and I fully believed that these children were absolutely capable of every single thing. Because it felt like I was there also trying to also scheme the mind games with them. Yeah, I mean, when I first read it, I so I just completely just let it, you know, run its course. You know, I just accept everything the plot throws at me because I'm always like shocked at what's happening. I'm like, oh, what? He did what? <laughs> she thought. She thought what? Yeah. And it's like because so I like I marathoned it when I first read it, so I was just you know, uh, head empty, just literally eyes consuming everything like a scanner. <laughs> yeah, it's good. So yeah, I that was really enjoyable for me. I think that's why because it's just the, it makes like a lot of logical sense and made it enjoyable and not boring or unbelievable at all. To be fair, um, when I think back, like when I was 11, I was at, so in the UK, in primary school, 11, you're around like year five or year six, year six like around that. Yeah. Or in America, it's like the sixth grade and seventh grade, that sort of like area. So I was thinking, yeah, I think we're old enough to be smart. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> not um completely just all about playing right i think at that point we were already sort of memorizing the multiplication tables <laughs> and such so i feel like yeah being that smart at 11 is acceptable in real life i mean well coming in coming in like as an adult it's easy to see anyone below like maybe 12 at the same kind of age unless they're like a baby right and like looking back now when you're you know you you start doing times tables quite early on actually um and around year six or so so that's ages like 11 ish you would be doing i guess really all the times tables um maybe maybe doing some stuff on like area some fairly basic stuff on area for for maths and whatnot and they're doing they're doing like three-dimensional area and division so one of the questions they have is they've got like um a 3d shape made up of boxes uh like cubes and they have to work out how many cubes make this up. Uh, so it's a few steps higher than what we were doing at 11. But it is like reminiscent of mm. the kind of problems you'd be doing. Actually, I was thinking when I was in primary school, uh, for most of the years, I, it was, I was educated in China. So um, I can tell you that the, at least from what I knew, like, in, like my scope of knowledge is only within like primary school uh, how how it works in China is that um we are definitely in terms of maths anyway are uh, ahead of the kids in uh UK uh definitely because the the maths questions that we were given are com- like definitely more difficult I mean my memory is a bit, bit vague now but I just remember acing all the maths questions back in primary school because I'm like I did this like two years ago like what what's happening so, so what you were talking about, probably were taught by kids in primary school back in China. In, <laughs> in 10 seconds. <laughs> Maybe not in 10 seconds, but like with practice, right? These kids probably had like practice. You know, yeah, real. I could believe given that that's like the only thing they do, just either working or playing and that they've got quite a good method to learn. I could see them being a lot, lot better than we are here. There we go. There we go. Either way, it didn't affect my enjoyment whatsoever. I guess we all agree. 11 year olds are smart (laughs) and can be geniuses. Would you guys have been able to escape if you were 11 and in this situation, do you reckon? Do I have the mad manga mind power as well? Let's say you have 50% of that. No, absolutely not. (laughs) I mean, you just said it. (laughs) 
I feel like, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be one of the Gilders. I, you know what? I look like Gilda. <laughs> glasses, I have short hair. But I think Jay's glasses are more like to Gilda's. Like, they're that round. You've got the big round ones, oh, yeah. yeah. Mate, I would be Connie. <laughs> oh, you know what? Take that as a compliment, but like Emma kind of reminds me of you a bit, Jade. Like this like positive attitude. Like, also I'll always take it. On and stuff in, in that sense anyway. I will accept it. So if we were to assign Emma, Ray and Norman oh my God. to ourselves. So if I'm Emma, yeah. out of the two of you, who's Norman and who's Ray? Based on physical appearances, I think Ollie would be Norman and I would be Ray. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, come on, like you'll both have short hair and me and Ray both have longer hair. It's true, it's true. <laughs> and dark hair, actually. So yeah, you know what, actually, like physically, like the Norman's appearance, I could see, I could see as Ollie. I've got the same haircut and everything. Yeah, exactly. I was like, you know, I followed the exact question, like, if we were, I, <laughs> but I was like, but I'm, I'm not smart enough to be Ray. But you know, if I had to be one, I'd probably be Ray out of the three of us. <laughs> Just by pure appearance. And that's like the closest I can get, like, not even like intelligence level or the like, the... speaking of the big three, what did everyone thought of the three main characters? I thought they had a good trichotomy would you say where they bounced each of the personalities was each of their personalities was different but similar and i thought that worked well to not only mean that they each have kind of their strength but also their weakness and their reason for having discord in the group this then meant that you could use that to further the plot that you could have plots between the allies which was definitely one of the more interesting things to watch and I thought it quite worked quite well to display people's motivations as well for why they do what they do. Um, you see this most commonly with differences between Emma and Ray. So Ray, being the dark-haired kind of edgy one, was the one that was like, hey, we're not going to save everybody. We're going to just save us. And Emma, being Emma, said, no, we're saving everybody. And that created some tension in their group and meant that everybody had to, I suppose, solidify their view on why they wanted to do what, what they were going to do and find a motivation, I suppose. Just decide what, how far they're willing to go to achieve their aims. I think the three main kids worked well together as a trio. And I think if I had to have a favourite, it would probably be Ray. I like the way he thinks and he was behaving how I thought he would as an 11-year-old like wanting to protect yourself, wanting to also save your friends at the same time and also kind of switching between who to work for, that kind of thing. And Norman, I thought, was really brave. And I really liked Emma as well because I liked that she was determined to outwit Isabella and, you know, help all the other kids. Um, Despite the odds, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I think... They work well as main characters, and I think the three of them there is perfect. I don't think a fourth main character would add anything unless... Actually, no, maybe they would, but I'm happy with these three being the base. Did you think Norman had died at the bit where they make you think he's died? Yeah. Because, Mm -hmm. yeah, the three main characters almost fit too well together for me such that if one of them had been removed that early in the story, it would have left a fairly large gap in their kind of completeness of character between the three of them. Uh, So, for example, if Norman had died, there wouldn't have been that middle ground to bring Emma and Ray together because he he worked quite well as a middleman for that. So, I don't know, I didn't think for even a minute that Norman had actually gone, but I was interested to see what had happened. Yeah, for me, I mean, like, obviously I'm coming from the fact that I've read everything. But when I was reading this, I did not believe either because I, I was, or I held on to the fact that he said, huh, like, like confused, huh? Okay, if you're about to die, <laughs> you don't say, huh, <laughs> right? You say, <No. laughs> you'll be like, I don't know, like you'll be, you know, dressed for, or like in Norman's case, he's trying to put on his brave face, you know, prepare to death. You don't say, huh. You say, what okay? <laughs> 
or nanny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so that I, I strongly I, I held on to that for like no, I refuse to believe that he died. <laughs> That's good. I like that faith. Uh, yeah, I was ready to believe anything and everything. I think it helped me to be more surprised that when he was actually alive than to be sort of cynical at first and be like, oh, okay, I knew all along. I think it helped me personally in that aspect. So yeah, I totally thought he had died. Let's form a uh, common circle that uh, <laughs> for, for Norman, hoping that yeah, he'll come back. Um, I think one of my uh, favorite moments in the manga is the way I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but they sort of built up with the side, like mini size stories at the end of the chapter of what's going to be the one thing that um, Norman takes with him when he sort of gets sent off. Because all the characters that's been adopted, quote unquote, uh, have these toys or sort of mostly toys belonging that they house so dear to them that you know, they take the thing to their foster family again, quote unquote. Air quotes, yeah. Yeah. And I just love how they tell the story of, you know, uh, when they were younger, that Emma wanted to sort of spend time with Norman so bad that finally she came up with this idea of making uh, a string telephone. Uh, and then at the end, we sort of, again, through like a non-official, I guess, panel that is like, a rough drawing of what was inside Norman's suitcase and it was almost empty but it turns out it was the string telephone I was so touched by that when oh. I read. I'm still touched by it now I just love their interaction like I agree completely with what you guys said about their sort of di- the main freeze dynamic because they just work so well together you have Emma the reckless one and you have Ray who's like telling her off all the time or making sort of you like using her naivete against her like <laughs> telling her that you know oh you know only uh idiots don't catch cold <laughs> or like uh if you catch a cold from someone else and that person would get better <laughs> faster and it's just that was so funny to me what do you think about the other kids because we see a lot of the main three emma norman and ray but we also see some of the other kids um, none, none in particular na- that I'm naming right now, but what did you think of them? For me, I love Phil. He is baby. I just, he's just so cute. I just, do you know the mouth where it's like uh, up like a sideways free? Like I, that's my favorite mouth. <laughs> it's so cute. Character. And the way that he's just like so smart as well. I almost thought that he's like a traitor. Like at the beginning, I was like, you, you innocent cutie. <laughs> <laughs> he's Definitely. too cute to be innocent mm, yeah and then the fact that he figured out morse code i'm like yo this ain't right there's something fishy is happening here but you know it turns out he's his baby i i love him uh he's probably one of my favorite characters next to emma just just a quick second about emma i think i forgot to plug uh emma is amazing the world needs more of her sort of optimism and her sort of drive to defeat the impossible despite the odds because she just generally wants to help everyone save everyone, despite the fact that Ray and Norman are like doubting her. The two smartest person, may I add, well, she is also smart, but obviously she doesn't have, she's not strategic enough, but I just love her for that. So for me, is Emma Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Chef's kiss. <laughs> this is going to sound really weird, but my lack of interaction with kids in real life has sort of filtered over to my uh, bonding with kids in media such just as eyes manga. glaze over whenever they yeah. appear on screen i mean they're all just kids to me it's like just one big entity of kids <laughs> to me now i don't think i don't think they particularly stood out i think as a whole they were just yeah they're kids they're trying their best and i love them but yeah i have nothing to say on this um i mean there are definitely a lot of panels where you kind of just see them as an amorphous group of kids yeah which works well to give that impression of there are more characters there and the fact that some of them are named quite a few of them are named actually does really help and it makes you have at least some investment in them i think they spent the right amount of time fleshing out the kids enough that you kind of cared about them but almost more as a as a plot device than being 
directly emotionally attached to any other than Phil. <laughs> you care about kids as a concept rather than just any <laughs> individual. It's a, oh, yeah, you want to see you want to see them all, you know, happy and, and everything, but none of them are differentiated enough that you'd have any particular feeling for one in particular. I said particular twice, but you get the point. No, like I, I, I understand because they all definitely from the get go your attention is drawn to Emma Norman Ray. They're the main people you care about because they're the smartest and they're the key to saving the other kids, right? But you know what? I feel like this is done well because in a way, Ray also was in the mindset that, you know, only the oldest kids can survive. So Ray always also saw sort of him and Norman and Emma as, or maybe even Gilda and Don, as like the only people who are capable of escaping Gracefield. But his expectation was subverted by you know, Emma's persistence, you know, having faith in everyone and trained everybody uh, to become, you know, less useless, right? <laughs> and more so sort of can like, fend, sort of can escape as well. Um, so the time skip during that two months after that Norman was sent away, like, Ray did not expect that the little kids knew what was happening, right? Like, uh, he thought they were not emotionally capable of handling such things, but in fact, they proved him wrong. And at first, he thought, I think I noticed it because I reread it, like, that's the second time, is that he at first thought it was Gilda and Don who was doing all the hard work of collecting supplies. But in fact, the plot twist, it was those kids, you know, the ones that we were introduced at the beginning. If you didn't notice, we were, all of these characters were not just like made distinguishable towards the end. They were, they were all always in the background and foreground or in like uh, from the very beginning. Like in a way, I guess like for me anyway, I feel like at first I'm like you guys, I only care about the main three, but I think slowly as the plot goes on, as they review more of their like capabilities, I appreciate them a lot more. I feel like at, at the time I was like, oh, maybe we'll get like more sort of de- development from these characters, especially Gilda and Don. I feel like they add a more bit of a flavor to them, yeah. just, you know, than this quirky jock guy and this like quiet and like, you know, maybe thoughtful uh, girl. I really like their designs as well. I like that all the kids are still kid-like. I'm talking about all of them, including including the 11-year-olds, but quite distinct. Yes, um, who's your favourite de- design-wise, actually? Because I really liked Gilda's design. Um, just those those glasses were huge. I thought they were excellent. I feel like maybe I, we see them the most, so I quite like the main three, uh, especially... Like, if you really think about the design, like, Ray is just an emo or a scene kid. You know what? <laughs> That's more and more accurate. He's a scene kid, right? Is, He's the Sasuke of yeah, the comics. Yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely. There's so many Sasuke's out there. Norman, uh, at first, I hated his haircut. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> because it was just so short. Like, have you ever seen uh, Adahana? Nope. Do you know her? She also had a really short fringe like up there. I'm like, what are you doing? But as time go on, I learned to love his design. Yeah, I think I would, it would be Emma's. I just love her, like, red hair. And it's just so, it's like, do you know there's a name for the flick of hair that you have at the top? A hoge? Yeah. Chef's Not kids. to be confused with a hair gal. That's something quite different. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. No, <laughs> no, no, don't do that. <laughs> uh, I hate it. <laughs> We've all seen the Twitter post where somebody's messed it up. Yeah, Ray for me, definitely. Go emo or go home. Exactly. <laughs> Approval. Um, yeah, pretty much. Speaking of artwork, so we're sort of sliding in, like way our way in here. What did people think about the art in general? Uh, because for the main characters, when they're on screen, you see you know, them as very detailed, very nicely designed. But I think for me, often like the art can be good and bad. Sometimes it, this artist has a range. Like some of the kids, they look so weird on the page. Like their eyes are like so close together suddenly, like <laughs> or really far apart, just like depending on the angle you look at it. But then, you know, at first I was like, wow, this is a weird art style. But then you will see them do really awesome detail. Like, you know, those like first co- like chapter cover pages. I've taken like so many screenshots of those because they're just amazing. Like the conversation is amazing. So it's really like a hit and miss sometimes. <laughs> Mm, I think 
in a I'm in a similar kind of vein where I would put it distinctly in the middle of what we've read. Um, that's to say it's good, definitely. There are quite a few really good frames where you have these, you know, beautiful landscapes or really quite terrifying character designs. Um, think particularly that panel early on when they first see the demons. That That's so good. As you said, though, there are some background characters and just generally some... I don't want to say lapses in quality, but I don't know. I wasn't feeling anything in particular. You know, comparing it to, say... I don't know, Bleach, where we have certain almost comedy scenes, which are fine in a lower quality. And there there are some comedy scenes in this too, versus, you know, something like Witch Hat Atelier, which was just goddamn gorgeous all the way through. So yeah, I'd put it bang slap in the middle of what we've been reading. I liked it. Yeah, uh, I actually really agree. I think the covers were beautifully drawn, but then the uh, um, actual action itself wasn't the same but I do love the clear distinction between how they draw the cute kids all smiley and bubbly and then you switch to the really scary demons I think they did a good job with that yeah definitely so with character design so I think there's one uh sort of character in the manga that I think we should sort of raise awareness of but there are some controversies around uh, the particular character design of uh, Sister Crow. I don't think we uh, have this sort of uh, enough background knowledge or even um, have sort of a well-informed conversation about this. There were linked some articles, I feel like, that will give uh, good insight onto why this could potentially be problematic and sort of people's arguments for and against it um, in the description. And one thing I would comment on about the art is that it gets, I want to say it gets better, as the, at least more consistent. Like, Because I feel like at the beginning, anyway, I think without the hair styles, it will be quite hard to distinguish from certain characters. Like, I swear Norman has like five different faces in the, at least the first couple of chapters. You, you'll see. <laughs> okay. I look forward to it getting better. It's not, it's, I did enjoy it so far and I am finding it, Engaging, definitely. I would like to see what happens later, definitely. I'm interested. Like the plot is like an onion, right? Like an ogre, it has layers. Uh, wait, like an ogre? What? Yeah. Have you not seen Shrek? <laughs> uh, many years ago. It's like the most reference joke. It's like, you know, you know, o- you know where the ogres, I'm an ogre, you know, you know, they have layers. <laughs> I'm ogre this joke. Sorry. <laughs> Can yeah. resist, so. so many layers, just like <laughs> onion or ogre. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, I married. I saw. I remember. I read because on Show and Jump, uh, as a member, uh, you can only read a hundred pages a day. Hundred, sorry, chapters a day. And I, I think for this manga, uh, I read at one point. I only had like twenty chapters remaining, like in one day, single go. It was crazy. Uh, it was so good. Like I was hooked. Um, I mean, I'm definitely going to be continuing reading it. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. So we got to chapter 37, where, obviously, spoilers for chapter 37, the kids escape and they make it outside the wall. And I'm interested to see where the plot will go next. It's really hard to predict because we know so little about the outside world, but so do the kids. And the earlier section where you can see them trying to gain information essentially and they're doing the whole thing with like the dates the books were published and everything gives me a lot of hope that they're going to figure out a lot about the new world when they when they go into it so i'm definitely interested to see what happens next i think 37 was just right for me i'm not sure if i'm gonna continue reading it because i felt like it was all action 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 and then when they actually got into the forest it's like okay you can we can breathe now. They're finally free. Well, not finally free. It's just that they are still trying to make their way to safety, but it's kind of lost that sort of um, mind game aspect of it, which really hooked me in the beginning. But um, saying that, I think I will probably come back to it at some point and finish it now that I know that it's a completed series. That does definitely help knowing that it's completed because this kind of mystery plot is 
often one that is really frustrating if it's not yet finished. And I had this with Attack on Titan, which follows a fairly similar vein where, you know, they're stuck inside a wall and then eventually. Um, and knowing that there is a definitive end and you'll get answers to your questions is, for me, really enticing. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, I completely understand because it's <clears throat> definitely a very intense series whereas where there are not a lot of, um, at least so far, we, we've seen there's n no filler or no like sort of break, right? As, apart from, you know, the extra chapters, extra sort of small size stories. Mm -hmm. But it's always like one mystery after the other that they have to solve. So I understand that, you know, people might want to take a break from this because it's just too intense and too heart-wrenching because you want them to survive. <laughs> Speaking of heart-wrenching, the last manga we read was pretty heart-wrenching. Um, I did end up actually finishing that night after our last episode. Mm. Um, man, that messed me up. But we have a special section in this show mm -hmm. whereby we pull the, one of the characters, normally the main character, from the previous manga into this world. Uh, so if Pom Pom was pulled into the Promised Neverland, how do you reckon he'd do? I feel like he wouldn't really be taking initiative. I feel like he would just be going with it. I think I feel like he would just be going with the flow and sort of questioning everything inside because I don't feel like he'd be the sort of person to be like oh I'm, I'm gonna break out of here and you know this is what we're gonna do we're gonna do this this and this I feel like he would take the role as a sort of he would do what people tell him to do but he wouldn't be the one to sort of have all these like brilliant mind game ideas. I agree I feel like he's more of a more passive person than a so the person would take. I mean, the whole point of the plot is that uh, he's not one to take control, <laughs> right? That's true. Uh, but I feel like in there, I think, so remind me, was he like a pompon a pom -pom at the beginning? Was he also sort of 11, 13, or was it just 13? I think he was, a, I think he was 11, you know. I don't quite mm -hmm. remember, to be honest with you. So I feel like he would be in enjoying life i feel like uh, and maybe sort of focusing on uh, pursuing a love dress. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> poor poor pum pum does need some enjoyment of life yeah yeah i mean i think he will definitely fit in like he'll probably have fun playing with all the kids and you know away from abuse which is good but also but then good to a certain extent when they found out the truth and you know yeah um, he wouldn't he wouldn't cause waves unlike for example bringing guts into princess jellyfish yeah <laughs> which would have been quite the plot twist yeah exactly so yeah i feel like he would escape uh with them uh if not he's already been you you know what actually not to be <laughs> mean to him he's he's probably won't even make it to 11 because he's not smart right? that was yeah that was that was kind of what i was gonna go with not that he wouldn't <laughs> not for that like, reason i was like wait a second he'll probably be shipped off at six years old <laughs> For me, it would be because he didn't take the initiative. Oh, mm, oopsie. <laughs> you know, maybe he'll surprise us, be, you know, under the right conditions, he's like a genius, you know. He'll be he normal. He'll be normal. Maybe he'd even accept death. What? What, what a sobering thought. <laughs> what a sobering thought, indeed. Wow. Amazing. Unlike the main characters, I'm looking forward to seeing them defying the odds, escaping, and uh, who knows? I actually have no idea what's going to happen later on, but I'm excited. Amazing. Yes. So this concludes our episode on The Promised Neverland. I hope you enjoyed it. Next episode, we will be reading Grand Blue. Um, surprise change. Uh, so this is by Kimitake Yoshioka. It is a comedy. I thought we needed some levity after the last two. And we're going to be reading up to chapter 28. Get excited. Let's go. I hope you like deep sea diving. <laughs> and mid-sea diving and alcohol. See you oh, next think... water time. <laughs> See you next what? See you next water time for the five people who will get this reference. <laughs> oh, is it a free reference? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Did not get. Sad face. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you for joining. Thank you. See you next See time. See you next episode.